Hi, SBC family and guests who might be watching this. We're in a different circumstance than any of us have experienced before. In response, I'd like to share a thought or two with you from God's Word on a semi-regular basis. Consider this a brief pastoral visit and hopefully an encouragement to you as we walk through this time apart and together as followers of Jesus. The Apostle Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians 12, prompted by the Spirit of God. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. And further on, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Across Canada, and in fact, many parts of the world, we're practicing something called social isolation. Neither of the words are new to us, but combined and applied the way that they are now, this is a new practice for us. It's a massive, costly, and we hope effective attempt to lessen the projected impact of what is being labeled COVID-19. The effort depends on people not being in physical contact. We hope this has an immediate societal health effect. I think it can have another useful effect in the lives of believers. I think the absence of physical community might remind us sharply of the spiritual necessity that followers of Jesus be the body of Christ for and with each other. In the scripture I just read, as the Spirit of God directs Paul, we see a little bit of his sense of humor, his sense of the absurd peeking through. He writes of monstrous feet and eyes and our ears arguing with each other, each trying to be the center of attention, each thinking it's the most important each trying to go it alone. Paul was speaking to the church at Corinth and they resembled those bickering body parts. Many in that church were trying to use their spiritual gifts to be the stars of their own show instead of in service to others. Some were trying to use God's grace to them as a get out of jail card that allowed them to treat other people whatever way they wanted and then say, but I've been forgiven. There were even church meals going on. Ironically enough, they were called love feasts. Church meals where the rich of the church would sit at one end of the table with their steak and caviar, while the poor sat at the other end with their crust of bread. So Paul tells a tale of bickering body parts to get an important lesson across. He wanted them, and us, to understand that when Jesus died to free them from sin and hell and death, he has freed them to the life of love inside the body, the community of Christ. And he was explaining that this is a life where we practically care for and are committed to one another, following the example of Christ. You and I know this. We know that the life of the follower of Christ is a life where we're called to be together, not going it alone. So the apostle says that those in Christ in the body, can't say, I have no need of those other parts. Now, the self-reliant among us might bristle at this. We might think, well, I know that I'm useful to others. With my particular set of skills, abilities, and expertise, I understand why they need me, but I hardly need them. As Simon and Garfunkel saying, your theme might be, I am a rock. I am an island. Yes, I know, I've dated myself with that reference. Google it, please, young people. But consider this. Jesus Christ is our ideal, our complete man, the one whom we want to be growing up into and more like. Our most ancient hymn about Jesus in Philippians 2 says this, Have the mind of Christ in you. He took on the nature and character of a servant, and humbled himself. We cannot grow toward our ideal, toward the completeness of Christ, without a humble willingness to serve the body. 
you and I need the body in order to truly emulate and follow our ideal. What this looks like and what kind of actions it motivates needs to be thought through carefully by each of us during a time of social isolation. Our commitment to be the body faces an additional obstacle. We know that we need a particular awareness of and a commitment to reach out to the vulnerable in our midst, looking for practical ways to assist without putting people at risk. We know that we need to find ways to cultivate meaningful communication and times of prayer and encouragement with brothers and sisters in Christ and with friends and neighbors. We are called to be the body. And at the end of this, I pray that this will be a reminder of our need to be continually, gratefully pursuing the life of Christ in community. When this time ends and things return to normal, the spiritual life-building prompting of Hebrews 10.25 should be valued more than ever. Let us not neglect the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some. You are the body of Christ, and everyone members of it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to consider your truth. And we thank you that in this truth, the reality of it is that you have made us to be a part of the body of Christ, with Christ as our head, our ideal, our example, the one that we want to follow. And as we think of the servanthood of Jesus Christ and his commitment to care for those around him, not because he needed us, but because he loved us, may we in fact be servants. May we be people who, even in this time of social isolation, consider how we can care for those who are part of the body and how we can serve those around us. May we be the body of Christ and everyone members of it. We pray this in the name of our Savior, our example, our ideal, Jesus Christ. Amen.